Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Amitav Ghosh's much-awaited novel. My name is Meru Gokhale, and I am the publisher of Penguin Press. Gun Island is one of the most highly anticipated books of the year, and here we are this evening with what I believe is the novel of our times. This week, Amitav was awarded the highly prestigious Gyanpeet Award making him the only Indian author writing in English to be given this honor. Thank you. It's a unique achievement, and we're extremely proud to be his publishers. So from the very first page, Gun Island is a novel that will pull you into its web of mystery. It's like nothing you've read before by Amitav, and most importantly, it is steeped in the pressing issues of the dangerously changing world that we live in today. It is an honor to be publishing this work of great importance, and we are delighted to launch it tonight. Thank you for being here with us. Amitav will be in conversation with the award-winning writer Raghu Karnad. We are deeply grateful to Raghu for being here with us tonight. His father, the late Girish Karnad, was himself a recipient of the Gyanpeet Award 21 years ago and has been a great inspiration to so many of us. He will be sorely missed across India and around the world. I would like to now call Amitav and Raghu on stage to formally launch the book. Let's give them a big welcome. You know, part of the reason that I wanted to go ahead and, um, and come to Delhi and, and go ahead with this event is, uh, one is that I really loved this book and there was a lot to, to talk, uh, talk to you about. The other is that, apart from the fact that one, Gyan Pete has left us and another one was recently appointed, uh, there's a great deal that I think you and he had in common as writers and some of the things that you just mentioned. Uh, the way that you use myth, and the way that you use language, not as, and the roots of language, not as things that need to be left out of modernity, but as essential keys to navigating and understanding our modernity and our chosen modernity. That's something that's obviously a powerful theme in Amitav's books and very much so in this one. Now, there is also a difference. I think while my father was a chronicler of the kind of mythic and historic life of of Karnataka especially and of this, of this country, uh, I consider you to be a, almost unique as a chronicler of the life of this planet. I know that sounds a little bit, a little bit hyperbolic, but I think anyone who's read one of Amitav's books, right from the first one to the latest one, will probably agree. They're, they're always concerned with the kind of interconnecting, sometimes invisible parts the countless parts that, we, that, that, that move and interact, that we are in the middle of, though we can barely understand our immediate surroundings. And the forces that move that system can be language, they can be material forces like trade and war in other books, and sometimes they are the ecosystem, they're the climate, and that's the place is such an important element in all of your books. You, the, the, the specific locations link up in the way I just described, to global patterns. So I'm really curious about where you were sitting. What were the places that you were physically in when you, uh, when, when you began, to, when you put pen to paper? You know, actually it's interesting that you asked that because uh, I very well remember where I was. I, I was in my study uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn. I was thinking about, you know, I had, I had promised a friend an article so I actually even know the date, it was in 2016. Uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, trying to get started on this article when suddenly these, uh, uh, this idea sort of came to me that, uh, you know, I want to write something uh, which, is, which reaches back into the past. But, you know, uh, when ideas come, they don't come out of nowhere. And for the last many years, I mean, really, uh, uh, since I've begun thinking about uh, so many issues in a different way. I've spent a lot of time uh, reading um, uh, pre-modern Bengali epics, you know, including, for example, uh, the, the Ramayana, uh, which 
uh, and the Mahabharat, which has a wonderful, uh, both have wonderful editions uh, in Bangla, especially the Mahabharat is Kashiram Das's Mahabharat, which is a very beautiful uh, rendition of the Mahabharat and completely, in many ways, very different from the Valmiki Ramayana. I'd been reading those, uh, uh, these long epic poems and sometimes that's just what happens, you know, something sparks in your brain, you know, and, and things start coming together. But you were in Brooklyn. I was in Brooklyn, but again, I'd spent, uh, I'd spent uh, a few months in, uh, in Italy. Yeah, I'm convinced that part of this book was written in Venice. Importance of Venice, among other things, is that it's the original kind of metropolis, correct me if I'm wrong, of, you know, globalization in the early modern era. And today, the sort of, it's sort of come full circle and it may be the first city that's fully destroyed by the ravages of the kind of modern, mo modernity we've chosen. And uh, yeah, and that, that, um, that kind of linkage across time is obviously the kind of thing that you do and a very important one in, in this book which is sort of mediated by myth and by language. Well, you see, uh, when I was in Venice, when um, you know, my wife and I spent these uh, weeks in Venice, one of the things that really struck me, completely took me aback, is that everywhere I looked, I heard Bangla. You know, people were speaking Bengali. Uh, and slowly one suddenly discovered that in fact, the entire working class of Venice now is Bengali. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's an extraordinary thing and it completely amazed me. And, uh, you know, not only was it Bangla, it was a very specific kind of Bangla. You know, it was Bangla from the environs of Dhaka. And I used to speak that dialect with my grandparents, uh, you know, with my grandmother especially. So it was this un almost uncanny thing that I found myself reverting to speaking a childhood language, uh, you know, on the streets of this town, uh, uh, Venice. And um, so, uh, you know, it that sort of jolted me in a way and it made me think about these connections and about these uh, the ways in which uh, you know things reach uh, around the world today yeah and forces that that uh, completely disregard uh, the idea of national boundaries no matter how much we cling to that idea uh, both the climate and the rising tide or the, or the rising water level in venice also the rising uh, the, the tide of migrants as you might call them uh, completely disregarding our attempts to yeah. draw clean lines uh, across the planet. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like most uh, people of my generation, uh, you know, my life is very much intimately tied up with my passport, visas. You know, I mean, those things uh, cause me incredible anxiety and, you know. Uh, but uh, it was so extraordinary to see these guys. I mean, the first, before they set, up, set off on their thing, if they have passports, they throw them away. And they just go across, uh, you know, boundary after boundary. I was so astonished to hear that actually the cheapest route for them to take is to get into a bus in Bangladesh and just go straight across India, across Pakistan, across Iran, uh, into Turkey, and then across, the, you know, across the Mediterranean or across uh, the Dardanelles, uh, you know. The uh, Silk Route, practically. It is exactly that. It is exactly that. And... <clears throat> You know, what makes it work, really, is that this industry now, it's, it's, it's a gigantic industry, you know, tens of billions of dollars. So everywhere you go, you, you can pay people off, you know. And this is not just in poor countries, you know. Uh, this corruption reaches very deep into the heart of uh, Europe as well. The mafia is massively involved in, uh, in, the, in people trafficking. Uh, so, the criminal organizations across the world have sort of uh, made these connections. The Nigerian mafia is very much involved. Uh, so, uh, you know, this whole thing is this vast enterprise, which I, th I, th I think it's now beyond the uh, power of governments to control it. Governments typically tend to do is to try and control how money or capital moves across the world and stop people from moving across the world. Uh, but then there are other forces of globalization that... Uh, that have other plans. Yeah, I mean, it's something very new and also something very old. I don't know if any of you have ever taken the crossing from, uh, the border crossing from Bangladesh into Bengal across Benapol. It's a sort of, uh, you know, it's a sort of customs house. 
I did that uh, some years ago. Uh, a friend of mine was actually uh, the Indian High Commissioner in Dhaka, and he called Benapol ahead and said, you know, make it easy and so on. But even then, you could just see the sort of uh, corruption that was, that, was, that was there. If anybody knows how to fix this at a, at a low level, I think they should get a prize because <laughs> I, I don't know how you fix that. Now, before we launch into any more kind of world history, I feel like I should uh, introduce the book a little bit better and tell you a little bit about the story. Um, the central character in it is a antique book dealer named Dinanath, who lives, who is from uh, Calcutta, but is but lives in the United States and is a little bit of a of a global nomad, who by some circumstances finds himself in the Sundarbans. No surprise there, uh, but finds himself. Uh, kind of exploring his way through kind of precarious area of the Sundarbans to a temple. Is it a temple? Yeah. To a temple where um, a folk tale or, a, or, a, or a, a piece of traditional lore has been, has been preserved. And that piece of traditional lore turns out to sort of be um, a clue or a, uh, a quest that kind of possesses him and eventually leads him to much larger events and, and to very different places across the world, including, including Venice. Which is what brings me to the next question I wanted to ask you. The last book, the previous book that Amitav wrote, was called The Great Derangement. And it's a slim volume and it's non-fiction. And it explores a real, a, a, a wide range of sort of, of, of topics and concerns, but the central question that links all of them is, how is it that we live in this derangement, which is our denial about what we're doing to the planet, and specifically to our climate. And because Amitav is foremost a fiction writer, the concern of the book is, where is climate change in our fiction? And why is it absent? And why is it so difficult to do? Uh, and it has very many creative and, and, and wonderful uh, answers and, and sort of uh, insights into that. And I really think that essentially The Great Derangement and Gun Island are companion volumes. I'm not sure that Amitav agrees. He kind of contradicted me when I put this to him inside, but I'm still going to go with it. Uh, one is nonfiction and poses a question and a challenge. It's a challenge to the business of serious literary fiction. To address this and to make us see better, and the other does exactly that. You know, so is I'm going to throw this back at you a second time, Amitabh. Is Great Arrangement the question and Gun Island the answer for you? <laughs> well, it's certainly my attempt at an answer, if you like. You know, when when I finished writing the Great Arrangement, uh, I suddenly sat back and said to myself, "What the hell have I done? I've written this book questioning." you know, how fiction approaches these subjects, and now I have to try and think of an answer, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, yes, I did, uh, I did. Uh, but, you know, the thing about writing, the thing about writing a novel is that you can't write a novel to uh, a prescription as such, you know. You just have to go where uh, your mind takes you. So, at the end of the day, uh, yes, these questions were in my mind. They did weigh very heavily on me. And uh, uh, I suppose... I suppose I was working my way towards finding some sort of way to deal. I wouldn't say it's, it's climate change. It's not just that, you know. It's something, it's something much more complicated. It's the reality that we live in, you know. And the reality that we live in today is so fractured. It's so sort of strange. Uh, there's something so uncanny about the way the, uh, the, way the world is changing that, uh, you know, I just had wanted to try and be able to present a picture of that world as I see it today. Yeah. So the word uncanny is this crucial word in the Great Derangement, and um, I, I don't know if this is the word you use, but the other one is, is another word that, that describes part of the challenge is, is holistic, which is um, the s literary fiction has taken a journey through the 19th century in, in the West and up to the present across the world, where it's become uh, partly by design concerned very much with the interior lives and the intimate details of the individual. That's almost, that's, that, that's, that's our immediate image of a great novel, is one that plums as deeply as possible 
into a character's, an individual's interior life. Now, that kind of thinking might be part of what's brought us to this, to this situation. And one of the questions the Great Arrangement asks is, what if what, what's actually required is for us not to understand the individual with that much more scrutiny, but to understand the whole, the whole that's larger than the individual, that's larger than the species, that might even be larger than our conventional definition of life, yeah. right? What, what, what if uh, our definition of life and agency actually needs to be expanded to, to include things that aren't just, you know, what we can categorize as biological life? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, see, <clears throat> I think, I think you've really pointed to the, uh, to the most important questions that we are looking at, you know, what is life? I mean, now, one very important book was published last year, you know, um, Richard Powers' uh, Overstory. You know, I think that was a very important book uh, because it again poses this question of, you know, what is agency? Wh what are the creatures which think? You know, wh what are other beings uh, apart from human beings? Uh, Overstory is about the, the life in tree canopies? About trees, yes. About trees. Yeah. It's an amazing book because we now know, uh, really, that trees communicate. They communicate with each other. And they often communicate through interspecies relationships with uh, fungi, you know. So it's a very, very interesting book uh, in which he, uh, you know, describes some of these phenomena. So uh, yeah, I do think that that is really the question: that how do we turn our attention away from this interiority? But Raghu, it's also important, I think, to remember that this interiority is something of fairly recent date. You know, it's basically in the last thirty years that this has happened, that this complete focus on interiority. And it's happened at exactly the time that greenhouse gas emissions was going up. You know, 50% of the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere were put there since uh, reforms, 1990. You know, that's the extraordinary thing. I mean, so if you think of, say, writers like Shivarama Karanth, for example, um, or, you know, in Bengal, we can think of so many writers. Um, similarly, we can think of uh, Gopinath Mohanty, I'm just mentioning the Gyan Pito award winners. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can see that, uh, you know, they had an intense focus um, on, um, on the world around us. But I don't see that focus really in the same way in uh, contemporary writing. No, I, I don't either. Sorry. But um, in terms of, of, of drawing out nature, so there's a couple of ways in which you draw out nature as something that deserves uh, an identity, that deserves a, uh, you know, some agency, uh, and some of them are some of them are very kind of vivid and beautiful, and they happen towards the climax. So I'm not allowed to talk about them, um, uh, and some happen right at the beginning, when uh, when when he be when he begins to glean the power of the myth. Or the, or, the, or the folk story that he's discovered at the temple in the Sundarbans. Um, he, it's, a, it's, the, it's the folk story of the gun merchant and the goddess that is pursuing him, uh, Manasa Devi. Yes. Uh, so obviously, when you're trying to lend nature um, a purpose, an agency, or even an emotion, a goddess is a very good figure in which to do that. Is, is that... Uh... Yeah, that's very well put. Actually, you know, um, uh, this figure of the merchant um, is a very recurrent theme in Bengali literature, you know, going back to um, 15th, 16th centuries, uh, you know. So they come in the form of uh, Mangal Kavyas, you know, so there, there, there are a series of Manusha Mungal Kabbo, as we call them, and in this, the figure of the, it's basically a conflict between Manusha Devi and Chand Shadagar. But, you know, the story has many sorts of iterations. Uh, there's also the, the, uh, the figure of uh, Chand Shadagar's son, Lukhindar, and his wife, Behula, also become very important in it. But uh, for me, the figure of Chand Shadagar is a very, very interesting uh, trope because actually, where else in the world do you have merchants as uh, folk heroes? You know, can you think of it? It's, and it's really strange because, I mean, Bengalis are not such great merchants after all. I mean, you would think that, you know, you would have that in, on the West Coast, you know, where the, this long history of trade and so on. 
but, uh, <laughs> you know, so it's a very interesting thing. I mean, in a sense, what this conceptualizes in a very early way is the conflict between prof the profit motive and, uh, and the world, you know. So I became very, very interested in this. After all, what is uh, someone like, uh, I mean, a goddess like Manusha Devi? I mean, she's basically giving voice, you know, to her kingdom uh, which, uh, or to her principality, which is the world of snakes and poisonous things. She's not the only um, formidable uh, female character in the book. The almost the most essential, in fact, clearly the most essential relationship in the book. There are a few formidable female characters who drive uh, the character, uh, drive your protagonist, Dina, Dina Nath around. The most uh, essential one is with his sort of mentor, who's a great uh, his, historian and an academic. Um, whom, he, whom he calls Sinta, and I'm forgetting, Sinta. Cinta. Cinta, <laughs> Italian. Um, was, was there, is there a similar character in your own life? It, it seemed to be, I, I was wondering if, 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 this, if she was modeled on somebody. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I have uh, many Italian friends, and uh, you know, some of them are very close friends. In fact, my book is dedicated to two of them. Irena Biniardi, uh, who's a very old friend for 30 years, and uh, uh, also Anna Nadotti, who's been my translator in Italian for more than 30 years. So, you know, these have been very important friendships in my life. But uh, they were not, certainly not the model for Chinta. Uh, Chinta became uh, a figure, uh, the more I wrote about her, the more interesting she became, you know. So, <laughs> I, often when you write a novel, you find that certain characters assert themselves, you know. And they take a larger and larger and larger role, and she really became that in this book. Yeah, one of the really important uh, provocations that she gives to to Dinanath, and 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 it sort of changes the cha changes the the ground beneath his feet, is that she challenges him early on mm. to see beyond just his strict rationalism, yeah. and um, and and his skepticism, you know, which 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 he mistakes for being. Uh, for, for being modern and for being sensible. It is really the case that once you start thinking at all seriously about trying to give voice to the non-human, uh, you find, your, find yourself just directly there, which is you suddenly realize that this is what human beings have always done. And not just in India. If you look at the Iliad and the Odyssey, I mean, so many kinds of non-humans uh, enter into it, you know. Uh, the sea, Neptune, the serpents, Laukuan, you know. There are all sorts of, uh, all sorts of animals and beings of every kind have a voice there, you know. So the question really is not that how do we give voice, it's actually how did we come to suppress these voices? How did we come to suppress these awarenesses? And it's interesting, especially in our context, you know, you mentioned the whole rationality and so on thing. And, uh, of course, your father was a great defender of, uh, of his friend Gorilan Kesh, for example, and so many others. And one can sympathize with that project of, you know, trying to create a rationality. But I always, when, when I would see the, the sort of vehemence of their statements on certain things, or many friends of mine who are rationalists, I would, I, I would just think, uh, how do you know? I mean, really, there are things in the world that we don't know. You know, and I think it's important for us to acknowledge that because it is these certainties of science and technology that have brought us where we are. I mean, if they knew everything, would we be here today? You know? So, um, there's, there's a very good, coming back to the great arrangement, there's a very good, uh, there, there's, there's one line that stayed with me. Here then is the irony of the realist novel. Realist is in quotes. The very gestures with which it conjures up reality are actually a concealment of the real. So, um, was that a new thought in the sense that did it give you a new challenge that you had to address in Gun Island in writing a realist novel and moving, or, and moving beyond it? Or did you think that you'd already, because Gun Island is not radically unlike your other novels, um, but was, was, was there a, is, is there a new adjustment away from, uh, you know, limited realism that you had to make? 
<laughs> you know, uh, the whole idea about realism, in fact, it's, uh, it's so illusory, really. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, words are little marks on paper. I mean, there's nothing real about them, you know. <laughs> you can't uh, uh, correlate that to any kind of reality. But uh, what, what the realist novel does is that it deploys a certain idea of probability. You know, what is probable, what is improbable, what is coincidence, what is not. And much more than novelists, it's critics who are deeply enmeshed in this, in this kind of thinking. You know, the, oh, this book is too full of coincidences or whatever. So certainly thinking about these issues in The Great Derangement, one thing it did do for me is that I stopped worrying about that. You know, if that's your concern, if that's what you're worried about, about the unlikely coincidence, yeah, you know, um, have a party, go ahead. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so th that just stopped being for me something interesting, you know. And in that way, it did sort of set me free to write uh, in a different way. I mean, so lots of books, both good and bad, use unlikely coincidences just in the sense of I turned the corner and there was the man with the knife. But that doesn't happen in Gun Island. What you're talking about is something more than coincidence. What you're talking about is, uh, is being accepting of, um, of meaningful uh, sort of, what is the word I'm looking for? Serendipities or, or, or meaningful uncanny events. You know, meaningful resonances that occur, uh, you know, between places and times and, um, and, and, and that sort of unlock the larger holistic picture, right? Yeah, absolutely. See, <clears throat> what is coincidence? What is chance? I mean, in fact, a novel can't be written without these, you know, someone turns a corner at some time, at some point, uh, and runs into either someone they know or someone with a knife or whatever. It's impossible to write a novel without that, you know. So, why do we try to disguise, you know, as it were, the mechanisms, these mechanisms? And it's simply to conform to some idea of, of chance. But what is chance, really? I mean, if, if I think of the Bengali word for, for one of the Bengali words for chance, it's uh, doibokrum, you know, which actually means the work of the gods, or doibokhutito, that is done by the gods, uh, you know? So, so, in a way, that idea of what we now call pure chance, why should chance be pure? I mean, that's a kind of, uh, already we are applying a language of sacrality to chance, you know, this idea of purity, as, it, uh, as though chance could be pure. So, you know, hidden within that idea of chance and probability, there are so many other sleights of hand, if you like. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say that that, uh, that actually hits very close to home at the moment for me, uh, because, uh, if you don't mind me, diverting into a slightly emotional subject, uh, I have spent the last three days almost continually marveling at um, at the chance of the circumstances in which my uh, father passed away, uh, which was uh, at the end of a very prolonged illness. Um, my sister lives on a different continent and I live in a different city, but we both happened to be uh, at home on the same weekend um, and a variety of of, um, of, 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 of concerns and preoccupations had, of, of his had just closed. And the Sunday uh, that, that was the last day that, we, that she and I were both meant to be there, we were both booked on flights to leave on Monday. Uh, we sat together, uh, the family sat together and had a conversation and, and, and spent a quality of time together that has been, you know, that has been very rare, especially recently. And the next morning, half an hour before my sister left for the airport, uh, my father was dead. And I don't know what to make of that. Certainly, if anyone had told me it was going to happen that way, I would not believe it. I'd simply not believe it. And I think that the odds were too long. And I don't mean to say that this is providence or that, it's, uh, that, that, it's, that there are larger forces at work. But certainly, life can be much more uncanny than you give it credit for. And, and to deny them the meaning in that is to deny, deny a lot of what's uh, worth celebrating about life in the first place. Yeah, it's staring you in the face. But why, uh, why do you think of it as chance? Maybe in a sense, because you were there, because it was this moment, he just let go. You know, I mean, look, uh, we know that... That crosses my mind too, but it just doesn't seem to fit with 
with our understanding of how it all happens, you know? Because yeah, but look, I mean, they've done studies and found that uh, after Christmas, uh, uh, death rates go up because people hang on somehow. And, you know, after that, they feel able to let go. You know, in the Indian tradition, Ichamrityu, uh, you know, dying of your own will was the greatest boon of all, you know? But in fact, maybe there is a possibility that at, at a certain point, someone can let go, you know, and maybe that's what happened. I mean, I think, you know, you're right. It's something uncanny. And in that uncanniness, there is something very profound and meaningful. Yeah, yeah exactly. But with this, this, I certainly don't feel the need, I, I don't feel capable of, uh, of uh, denying it and, 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 and just, and just uh, calling it a roll of the dice and, you know, it's good not. luck. As, which is which is the most that we can kind of rationally explain. So, yeah. Um, yeah so, th anyway, this this book. <laughs> thank you. This book has uh, thinking on some of the things in this book has meant a lot to me, both before and since this weekend. On more uh, on more newsy issues, which also in this book, you've written lots. You've you've written a lot about people moving around the world in all different forms of, of, of transport on, on, you know, in, in, in every different geography, and almost always, and, and very often illicitly in some way or the other, migration. This is the first time, though, that you've written, that, that you've had the, ch the opportunity, I think, to write about migration in the context of current developments, which are about to, probably going to bring us the, the greatest wave of human migration in the modern era, right? I mean, in one way or the other, all my books, as you said, um, address this issue of dislocation, of migration and movement. You know, what really caught my attention is when I saw these uh, images of uh, these young people crossing the Mediterranean in these boats, one of the things that really struck me is that the, the global discourse on it was about, the Syri about Syria, about the Middle East, and about Africa. But every time I looked closely at a picture, uh, you could see that many of the faces were South Asian. And they were never mentioned, you know, uh, in the sort of wider discourse. And I became really sort of interested in this. And as I followed up, I discovered that in some years, some months, uh, Bengalis are now the second largest group of arrivals across the Mediterranean in Italy. And that really astonished me. And I wanted to, I just wanted to know more because I couldn't find anything, you know any discourse on this, why is this happening? Who are they, why are they coming? So I spent a long time actually traveling around Italy and going to these migrant centers and meeting these uh, migrants and talking to them. And they weren't just uh, Bengalis, also I spoke to a lot of uh, Pakistanis, a, a lot of Arabs. So, you know, it was, it, com it was a complete revelation. I saw something that uh, I, I, I had never seen reflected in uh, either the the wider discourse on it or anywhere else. I, as you guys can tell, I could really get drawn too deep into this conversation with Amitav, but I do have to open the floor and allow you all to join in. Thank you, Amitav. Thank you. I've read most of your books, to be honest, all of them. But I think uh, in, in Dina's character, it looks like that there is perhaps for the first time the voice of Amitav Ghosh is the loudest. And there, is some, there are some autobiographical elements, especially his, his, his anthropological, his work with archives and his love for things that are of archival value. So I personally feel, I have read only the first three chapters, and I feel that this time your presence, your personal presence, is the loudest, what you have to say about it. Yeah. It's a mixed compliment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, if you're writing a book in the first person, uh, you kind of, it's, it's a very difficult uh, line to, uh, you know, to walk, because how do you not be uh, present, if you like? So, uh, yeah, I mean, in a way, some details of my life and this, uh, and Dinanath's life overlap, but, it's definitely not autobiographical in any sense, no. And I'm certainly, that's a completely different person from me. <laughs> but thank you. Hi, Amitabh. Hello. Yeah, see, uh, I have read your, uh, these three, four books, Hungry Tide in 2004, and now this uh, Gun Island has come. 
I, and I have gone through the other three books of their your Sea of Poppies and the trilogy. Uh, my one, just one question, because I have gone through in a couple of times with those th fat books. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always feel how much fiction is there into this, because they feel so much, uh, you know, true and realistic. Because when you have written about the Sea of Poppies and you have touched certain parts of Bihar and uh, Varanasi especially, I come from that part of the country, and uh, I found that, uh, have you been through all this, uh, you know, this Afim and all those things <laughs> that, <laughs> that you have written them? Because I didn't have so much of knowledge of Afim, the, the kind of, I got Let's from you. Let's start with that. So, <laughs> my question is that, if, how much fiction is there? <laughs> I really wish I had thought of that question. Uh, well, <laughs> what can I say? I mean, it's based on some real events, it's based on real fa I mean, it's based on facts, it's history, all of that is in the background. Uh, as for my relationship with Afim, <laughs> you, you know, all of us have taken Afim. I mean, if you've ever had, uh, if you've ever had a, an operation, uh, you know, uh, the anesthetics are Afim. If you, uh, many kinds of cough medicine basically are opioids. Uh, so you can't, you know, uh, Opium is something so knit into our lives that it's inescapable. It's everywhere. Hello, Amitav. My name Hi. is Nishtha. And uh, uh, you, this, this book, I'm, I'm yet to read this. I've read everything that you have written. I've also taught shadow lines. So yes, your relationship with me is, is, is very personal as a student <laughs> and as a, as, as a teacher. Um, Coming back to, uh, to the idea of uh, immigrants, in one of your previous books, you have talked about, you have hinted at, you've, um, at a particular moment in Indian history which has largely been you know, shoved under the carpet, the Morijampi massacre. I also want to understand your idea of violence and choosing subjects where you know you realize that you can't go you know full throttle and are you also trying to do something like that in this particular book as i said i haven't read it so no idea um you know i've dealt with all sorts of different kinds of violence in uh, you know in my essays and in my novels and shadow lines as you know it's built around uh, these scenes of, um, uh, scenes of violence, of war and of civil violence and so on. Um, in this book, I, if anything, I'm dealing with the violence of a completely different kind, which is the kind of violence that one, uh, that one thinker calls a slow violence. You know, because that's what we are actually un, uh, experiencing uh, right now, you know. If you think of a drought, for example, this prolonged drought that we have in central India, and in parts of Maharashtra, it's displacing hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. But the way that it unfolds is not in the sudden violence of, uh, say, a, a riot or something like that. It's this slow violence which, which eats into people's lives, destroys their lives, and unfolds in such a way that it never finds itself, or very rarely finds itself in the newspapers, you know. I think that kind, this kind of violence, the violence that we confront today, is, is, is of this kind, you know? It's this violence that is unf uh, unfolding around us through uh, human activity, but manifesting itself in, why, in larger forces. How do you find a way to write about that? I think that's the central question, the central literary question uh, of uh, this time. Good evening. So, Good yeah. evening. so in The Hungry Tide, you have Nirmal, who's sort of conflicted between prose and poetry. So in his diaries, he talks about that, and and you you can't call the diary entirely prose because you have these rhyming couplets in between. So it's it's a sort of mix of both. So have you also struggled with the two forms of writing, and what's your relationship with poetry? Um, well, you know, in the Hungry Tide, a lot of it was uh, it, there's a kind of sort of. Uh, meeting of different texts. I mean, for example, uh, the uh, Bon Bibi Johuranama, you know, which is uh, uh, the long poem about Bon Bibi. And that had a powerful influence on the way that I, that I wrote The Hungry Tide. And in this book, it's, uh, you know, uh, with the uh, Manusha Mongol Kabbo, uh, you know, 
again, it had a very powerful influence on, the, uh, uh, on this book. Because one of the things we do see is I think poetry is better able to respond uh, to the sorts of uh, the, the sorts of catastrophe and cataclysm that we see now unfolding around us in the world, you know? Is that because poetry has a license to, uh, to escape the, the bounds that are set on realist fiction? Exactly. Poetry doesn't have that commitment. You know, that commitment to always trying to persuade the reader to believe uh, that, you know, this, this could have happened. And poetry has always uh, responded to every kind of uh, natural event. I mean, yes. uh, you know, if you think of, for example, uh, Milton, I mean, you know, his work is born in the dark night of uh, the Little Ice Age. You know, so, so much of it. I mean, you see it in Byron and, you know. Uh, and you see a lot of it in, uh, of course, in pre-modern Indian poetry, you know. But pre-modern Indian poetry is never just, just poetry for the sake of poetry, you know. It's devotional. Yeah, devotion. Uh, I mean, devotion is uh, inseparable from uh, from pre-modern Indian poetry, and I think, in a way, we have to find our way back to that. I, I, I'm not saying back to devotion, but back to being able to think about something other than ourselves. <laughs> you know. You started this uh, conversation with um, a word of praise for my father, saying for about his public advocacy, and I think it's very important that we should return that praise to you, your advocacy, including your creative advocacy through a novel like this, and the effort to figure out how literature can do more to address our current crisis. I think that's incredibly important, and I think it's worth giving Amitav closing hand for that one. Thank you, and thank you, Raghu, for this wonderful conversation. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.